So Via 57 West in Manhattan is notable for a lot of reasons, and the design kind of centers around a courtyard being integrated into a skyscraper. But surely there's been courtyards in, in New York before. So what do you see as the, the truly innovative part of Via 57 West? And I guess I can ask both of you. Yeah, it's true, actually, that uh, courtyards have been in New York uh, throughout its history. But um, I would say since the Lever House, since the Seagram's building, sort of towers on podiums actually have sort of uh, predominated uh, the last 50, 60 years. So we actually haven't seen the courtyard as a typology. What I think is unique in its uh, sort of use here is that uh, the Durst organization actually asked us to uh, both take advantage of the, uh, of the density of the FAR of the site, which m kind of mandated a skyscraper, a tall building. But uh, because of the location of the site, also there was an opportunity of actually creating something that was internalized and took advantage of the courtyard. So the birth of the court scraper. I, there are, I think there are many uh, unique things about the, about the building. It uh, it's has a very wide base. 500 feet uh, by 200 feet. Uh, there really aren't very many tall buildings with uh, that wide of a base or ones that taper uh, to a very fine point at the top. So uh, the engineering, design, fabrication, and installation of the very unique sloped uh, geometric facade uh, was very, very complex. And now that people are starting to move into the building, are they using the courtyard in any surprising ways? Are residents and just people walking by interacting with that innovative design in any surprising or interesting ways? Uh, people are using the courtyard. I don't, I don't think there have been any surprises yet with regard to the use of it. How are they using it? Uh, they use it to uh, enjoy getting uh, just from one point of the building to another point of the building. Um, uh, there is a nice uh, barbecue pit and there is uh, there are some nice sunning areas, um, and uh, there will be, though it hasn't been established yet, it hasn't been turned on yet, a, a misting area as well for children. A misting area? Yes. So sort of like these fountains you see in various parks, oh, yeah. uh, something similar, just not quite as boisterous. So this is definitely a reaction to the site, as we've already discussed, but I wonder if this, ex this experiment in, in integrating a courtyard into a skyscraper in this way inspires BIG to go and do this, replicate this elsewhere? I mean, are you learn what are you learning from this process of design that might inform future projects? If you look at uh, our work, uh, I think we've uh, been looking at and working with courtyards uh, since we started working. Uh, the VM, the Mountain, the Eight House, they're in a way all sort of a further development of the courtyard and tweaking it or sort of working within the courtyard's limits. Um, Douglas Durst actually came to Copenhagen and toured the mountain uh, and the eight house while it was under construction and actually imagined this sort of full or two thirds of a Manhattan block as a perfect place to actually start thinking about um, how to uh, take advantage of a courtyard. Hmm. And that was the origin of the idea then? The Durst uh, company visiting and seeing? I think it, it, it was actually to test out whatever uh, ideas, because we have a very sort of iterative design process. So we went through, say, over 100 ideas for the site, but we kind of quickly came to the courtyard as like a, a, a great way, because you have a 1930s power plant on one side of the site. You have a sanitation department, a sort of a garbage truck uh, parking garage on the other. Um, and you know, you needed to sort of think about a way to uh, bring these uh, pioneers uh, to the west side of New York uh, and, and live there and want to sort of take advantage of uh, the coastline. You mentioned that there were a hundred designs that you thought of. What were some of the ones that didn't make the cut? Um, we have, uh, I think we also looked at sort of multiple mini towers on the site. Um, when we actually came to the idea of the courtyard, we'd actually sort of uh, made the peak at the uh, west side of the site. 
because we felt that you know there you would have the views out over uh, the Hudson River. Uh, but I think it was actually sort of a, 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 a workshop in which uh, Douglas came and sort of asked the question, why not actually pick it up on the northeast corner of the site so that everyone would have a view, both from the back of the site all the way to the front. And I think that was one of those kind of aha moments where, uh, where a client and an architect and the other sort of uh, consultants all working together uh, sort of make music. That part of Manhattan's changing very fast, and I wonder what you think the, the new character of the neighborhood is and how the Via 57 West project fits into that. Uh, the character of the neighborhood is changing. There is a lot of residential development that is going on around the building. Um, there are about a thousand units that are being developed uh, on one block to the south, uh, being constructed basically as we speak, um, and more residential development uh, to the north of that power plant with thousands of units that will be coming online, a hotel, a school, uh, are also being built there. Um, so it is uh, uh, becoming a, a very busy area and very attractive area. We have a few tenants moving in uh, that are um, sort of upscale tenants. We have landmark theaters as well as uh, a restaurant, Osea, that uh, has a very nice finish to it and should be opening soon. And so. Uh, the character of the neighborhood is certainly changing. Is there something that the neighborhood needs that it doesn't have right now? Um, a supermarket would be very nice. <laughs> a subway yeah. stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming, right? Yeah. Uh, not, up, uh, not up that far. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, oh, just one more question for you, since you both think about sustainability and uh, have some interesting projects that, that relate to, you know, uh, Remind me the term hedonistic sustainability. Hedonistic sustainability. Yep. There it is. Um, how do you approach sustainability in in your work? I mean, what's what's the guiding principle, and how do you view it from project to project? Uh, for for Durst, our guiding principle is to leave a place better than we found it. So we integrate uh, a sustainable thought process into um, everything we do. So with regard to uh, this, this building in particular, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of thought going into how we can reduce electricity, uh, reduce the amount of water used, uh, properly route it from the building into storage facilities, and uh, reuse it on the building itself, as well as putting in a, a campus uh, water system where we use uh, treated water uh, from the Helena building next door and use that in irrigation, um, uh, toilet flushing, and, and uh, condenser water makeup in the building as well. So we, we try to take a very integrated and thoughtful approach. I think it, the Durst organization actually is developing three buildings on one city block. And I think it's when you actually look at and, and that scale of a site, uh, being able to actually take advantage of the three different buildings through water collection, through sort of, uh, uh, you know, having um, heat and, uh, and cooling uh, systems that are all connected is a, is a chance for cities to uh, really think holistically um, a little bit more about being on-grid, off-grid, and how you can sort of uh, uh, think of these things all interconnected. Well, Kai Uwe Bergman and Alexander Durst, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.